So many of us have already beaten Metroid Dread. Some of us have beaten it on both normal and hard difficulty settings while getting 100%. But if you're one of those people who still haven't completed the game at all, please leave now. I don't care if it drops my audience retention, the Dread experience is simply one that you don't want spoiled. For those of you who are still here, congrats on beating the game and for being more resilient than all the crying beta male journalists. Even though you've beat the game, there may have been some things you missed if you weren't paying very close attention. First off, at one point, there appears to be a familiar foe in the background. One of the more memorable bosses from the legendary Super Metroid game was Dragon. This nasty flying green monstrosity has been pretty much completely absent from the Metroid series since its appearance on the Super Nintendo. But you might have missed a quick glimpse of Dragon in Metroid Dread. At Dairon, or however you pronounce it, at the top left corner of the map, there is a massive creature in what appears to be a cryo chamber that has a striking resemblance to Dragon. This is very brief and easy to miss since Samus turns on the power shortly afterwards and the cryo chamber becomes coated in ice, making it difficult to see the creature. Now Mercury Steam could have simply been making a small little callback to the famous boss of Super Metroid, but there may be some small reasons to speculate that it could be something more. Just underneath the cryo chamber is a large empty room that doesn't really seem to serve too much of a purpose. It's a complete dead end, has other tanks visible in the background, and is large enough to host a boss battle. Which leads me to wonder, is this possibly the location of a future DLC fight involving the famous Dragon? It's highly speculative and may amount to nothing, but it's cool little easter eggs like this that make you start to wonder. Second, the battle with Kraid is nearly identical to his original appearance in the NES version. Despite the passing of 35 years, Kraid's tactics haven't really changed, as the original Metroid pitted you in a battle in Kraid's chamber atop of a lava pit, just like in Metroid Dread. He's certainly grown and appears much more intimidating in his modern rendition, but his attacks are basically the same as he fires projectiles out of his stomach while also launching projectiles in a tomahawk style, making his attacks extremely difficult to evade. It's worth praising Mercury Steam for their innovation while also making this game feel as true to the Metroid legacy as possible. Number 3. Without question, Samus became 100% Metroid. This statement might seem rather obvious, but there's actually some level of nuance to it. As you know, if you've beat the game, Samus's Metroid DNA completely overcomes her, causing her to drain all of the energy around her, before she's eventually healed by the X-Parasite on her ship. I've seen many fans speculate whether or not Samus' transformation into a full Metroid only had an effect on her suit. The thing is, when Samus became full Metroid and started attacking Raven Beak, there were moments where you could see her eyes through the visor. But if you pause the action and look closely, you'll notice around the outer edges beneath her visor where her hair usually is, it's now a veiny, metrified looking edge of her skull. This basically confirms that Samus didn't just get a Metroid suit, but even her physical body itself became a Metroid. If this is the case, one can only wonder what her Zero Suit Samus form looks like as a Metroid, and hopefully it's a question we have answered in a future game in the franchise. Number 4. You may have thought this was the first appearance of Raven Beak in a Metroid game, but actually he was first revealed in Metroid 2 Samus Returns in 2017. The Chozo leader of the Makan tribe was first revealed in a Chozo memory. This memory is only unlocked if you attain all items within the game. This is the image of Raven Beak ordering the slaughter of the Thoha tribe, and at the time, we knew significantly less about this villain, and much of this image was a mystery. It's pretty cool to see how the developers were intentionally setting up the story of Metroid Dread much earlier than any of us had realized. Number 5. We actually witnessed the exact spot where Adam was no longer communicating with Samus, and instead it was Ravenbeak disguised as Adam. At the end of the game, it's revealed that Ravenbeak was posing as Samus's AI assistant Adam, but this wasn't the first instance where Ravenbeak did this, but it was actually much earlier before the gameplay even started. On the elevator, when Samus is first entering the depths of ZDR, Adam begins to lose signal and tells Samus that remote communication may be a problem. 
he advises her to try to connect to the facility's network before signing off and calling her lady as he always has. The thing is, the network's communication was compromised by Ravenbeak the instant Samus reached the bottom, and the game subtly hints at this by having Adam never refer to Samus as Lady after the elevator cutscene. This is because Ravenbeak is not familiar with that personal connection between Samus and Adam. It also explains why Adam seems to excessively praise Ravenbeak throughout the game, and why something like confronting Ravenbeak is called fulfilling her destiny by what appears to be Adam because it was never Adam in the depths of ZDR. It was always Ravenbeak speaking about himself. Number six, the damaged tubes that require power bombs to break are actually a callback to one of Super Metroid's most memorable moments. Back in 1994 was when we first saw Samus use a power bomb to destroy a glass tube, which was necessary for her to enter the world of Meridia to progress through the game. Dread relives this moment multiple times towards the end of the game, as a power bomb is required to destroy similar glass tunnels. Thanks to this reoccurring theme, it was probably a lot easier for those of us who had already played Super Metroid to figure out this part in Metroid Dread. Number 7. The central units are actually an homage to the franchise's most iconic villain. Kids these days may think of Ravenbeak as the ultimate villain of the Metroid series, but back in the day, it was the Space Pirates controller, Mother Brain. The central control units not only resemble the villain with their brain-like appearance and their protruding eyeball, but they're also accompanied with recognizable defense weapons, as the fire rings that are launched at Samus are similar to the rings attacking her in the early days of the Mother Brain battles. The developers gave strong attention to detail to this game and did a wonderful job of paying respect to the old fans of the series while also creating a fresh edition of Metroid for modern audiences. What are some things you appreciated about Metroid Dread? Let me know in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always, make sure to like and subscribe for more Nintendo content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.